through some of the stuff you did because you've done so much and it's been like more than 50 years since you've been doing it actually also which is quite amazing in a way I mean this is like if someone in 1985 would talk to someone who played in 1935 like if you put it in that perspective this is for me like really incredible what you've done already and uh, yeah it's quite cool and uh, I just wanted to ask you first this one question it's like I remember when we played together on some gigs you didn't use the oboe until the encore or the last song <laughs> and the entire audience was just waiting for that tiny instrument and, <laughs> and I wanted to ask you when did you start introducing first of all the oboe to your jazz repertoire because you started first classical music, right? Yes. Yeah, I said, well, I started studying classical music, but I, I, my, my father introduced me to Dixieland when I was uh, 12 years old. And he had a repertoire of uh, charts uh, for, for uh, New Orleans style jazz. Yeah. And that was my first introduction to uh, chords and scales and uh, being, being able to find all the good notes and the right notes at the right time. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was the beginning for me, but I, I was I studied the, 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 the oboe and uh, the saxophone. I started at the same time that I started the oboe. I was 13. And, oh, uh, wow, okay. And, uh, but I, I, when I, by the time I got to college and went to study with my classical teacher, he told me to give everything up, stop playing all those instruments and just play the oboe. So, oh, wow. So preparing me for a gig with an orchestra, something like that. Yeah, but because I've read you, you or actually told you told me, I think that you auditioned then for the New York Philharmonic as well, right? Yeah, that's right. One of but, my great achievements is to be a finalist for the New York Philharmonic. Oh yeah, you were the finalist. Come on, L luckily you didn't make it. So that's that's right, because I had that would not have had all the opportunities to learn how to improvise and interact with musicians in a special way and to introduce the oboe to another world that yeah. was something new at that point in time. But when did you start improvising on the oboe? Was that, was that like when you started playing with Paul Winter or even before like kind of really improvising? I mean, I started improvising a bit, you know, at first I started with, with Dixieland or yeah. uh, style, but uh, then I, I started to be attracted to Art Blakey and um, and some of that funky jazz that was happening in the 60s. Yeah. And uh, that, that was one of my first introductions to, to, to the structured improvisation. Yeah. And when I started to join the Paul Winter group, he, before I played a little bit of jazz on the saxophone, but not, without any, tra not with any training. And, oh, okay. uh, and, but Paul Winter was the saxophone player in the band in the Paul Winter concert. So uh, my main instrument was the English horn and the oboe. Which, oh yeah, exactly. Which he liked and really enjoyed those instruments. And I started developing my improvisational style and my voice and my way of phrasing uh, on the oboe and the English horn uh, in the context of Paul Winter's group. Yeah. Which also contained Ralph Towner, Glenn Moore and Colin Walcott, which cool. later became Oregon. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, Paul, that was those first records wrote, and then Icarus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. It was the first one with. Actually, I played on, on a few tunes on one of the, one record before that, but the, with the, with the Oregon group, that was Road and Icarus. Or Icarus. Yeah. I remember Icarus. I think this was the first record. I didn't hear hear Oregon first. I actually first heard Icarus. Someone gave me. Uh, I think it was a CD, a copy of a CD, and I started discovering, you know, like, well, who are these guys? And then I, it led me to Oregon, which is funny, like, usually would be the other way, I guess. But, yeah. yeah. 
But uh, in, at that time, you were on the West Coast or in the East Coast of the States? On the, on the East Coast. I moved out to California in uh, 1986. 86 was it? Yeah. So but, when you were when you were growing up on the East Coast, did you like did you see some of the greats like in New York also? Or I wish I had seen. I, I moved to New York in 1967. It's the year that Coltrane died, which was really so very disappointing to me. So so I've been looked so forward to seeing him play. But, yeah. Uh, I moved to I went to Manhattan School of Music in in uh, New York, and at that time I, I got to see uh, Gary Burton uh, with uh, his own band with uh, Larry Corey Allen, uh, oh. Steve Swallow on acoustic bass, and Bob Moses. And I was I went to went to that gig there the gig at the Vanguard. I went there every night for a week. My first week, my first week in New York, seeing Gary Burton with his. Uh, fringe flying around on his balance. <laughs> Only amazingly cool um, music that was really v rhythmic and also very, yeah. very funky. So, the beginning of fusion, basically, right? Kind of. Yeah, that was. The, I think that was one of the first bands. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but do you remember still some of the gigs that you did? You see that you saw at that time, like uh, uh, that you blew blew your mind, like improvisation wise. Let's say or. Oh, let's see. I was so wrapped up in my life as a college student that oh. I didn't get around to that many gigs. Okay. So I lived about five blocks from the Vanguard, so I oh. see a lot of the people who were playing there. Yeah. And Gary Burton was the first. Oh, I mean, but uh, I just wanted to return to Paul Winter first. Uh, like, did, did you know Ralph and Colin and no. Glenn from before, or was it like Paul actually brought you together? Yeah, he brought. What happened was the cello player with Paul Winter's group also was playing with Jim Harden. And oh, okay. It was a Richard Bach. Okay. A tremendous improviser, not jazz, but just really playing the cello in an improvisational way. And he also was doing some recording with. Uh, Tim Harden, who was a folk singer yeah. And, uh, yeah. and a great songwriter. And uh, so Colin Walcott was playing with Tim, and they, Colin and Glenn and Ralph all met uh, in Tim Harden's ensemble. Okay. <laughs> and uh, then Richard Bach was raving to uh, Paul Winter about how great these guys played, and they were playing uh, improvised music in the hallways of the recording studio. Well, they're trying to make this record. So Colin Walcott was playing these free improvisations on the sitar and the tabla to, to Ralph's uh, classical guitar. And that was kind of the beginning of their connection. Yeah. And they joined the Paul Winter group in 1971, I think. Okay. 71. And uh, we went on tour, like, a, I think we did a 10-week tour. What? Jesus, really? <laughs> really fantastic. And we... We would do like one free improvisation a night called Lose Your Mind and Come to Your Senses. This was our, our free, free improv piece. And uh, at that point, we used to play, use a, a koto scale, which every note fits with every other note. So there's no, no possibility of disaster. <laughs> a great starting point for us, uh, us as an ensemble and as improv. Yeah. But you, you guys actually kept it, right? That you, I think on every concert you kind of do a free impro. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's beautiful. But do you remember, like, when you first got the quartet, like Oregon, when you first hit it off without Paul, then afterwards, how, how was that like? I mean, was there immediate chemistry when you, you all guys got together, or? Yes. When we were working with Paul Winter, uh, the. The way we got around, we had two station wagons, one station wagon and an ambulance, and uh, we we put twenty five thousand miles on those cars. Wow. We went we went on tour, and uh, Colin and Glenn and Ralph and I uh, traveled together, and David Darling and Paul Winter traveled in the other oh, car, yeah. and uh, we we became fast friends. We had a great time. It was like a so it was a great experience to go on the road in America at that point in time. So many new things were happening. 
life looked so colorful. We got to, we went to all kinds of places down south and uh, out west. And we, we saw the, the hippies out there and the beautiful people. And uh, at that point in time, New Yorkers were all dressed in revolutionary blue, like blue, <laughs> and blue jackets. Yeah. California, they were like rainbow people. Yeah. It's it really a colorful time to be out traveling and uh, introduce us to playing for college audiences, which was really cool. Yeah. It's been good, but a great experience. People immediately accepted the, your sound. I mean, like, like how, how did people accept the organ sound, like in the beginning when you traveled all around? Like, because it was. It was pretty, very limited. And uh, also, we, we didn't do that much to make the audience comfortable. In particular, we always included some terribly um, this destructive kind of free piece that were the blow everybody's expectations away. But yeah. uh, we, we, the music was for us. That's that's who we were making the music for. And, yeah, uh, really exciting to be able to find something that we liked so much that that's really what we wanted to do. Yeah, and R- R- Ralph wrote some very melodic pieces which. Uh, Icarus, the most famous, I guess. But, yeah. Uh, now there's tons of a candle and. Uh, yeah, well, that's beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful melodic pieces, and those those opened the door to, to a lot of our audiences. Yeah, but in the beginning it was Ralph, like Winterlight and Distant Hills, who was doing the most writing, right? Yeah, Ralph, Ralph was definitely doing a lion's share of writing. But yeah. but then later on, you kind of you all slowly started chipping in, or. Yeah. Uh, well, we. Ralph encouraged all of us to, to come up with stuff okay. to give a, a different flavor to the, the music. That we played some of my tunes or some of Glenn's or Collins' tunes. It just it, it made a different tone color somehow and yeah. it set Ralph's pieces off in a nice way also. So it yeah. was a good deal for all of us and it made the, the records a little more, have a little more variety. Definitely, yeah. No, I love that about you guys, how, how, because the each one of you contributed, like, and, and I think it's like you hear almost which songs are yours, also because you still, you know, you sound the same, sounded the same, but like, it's still as composers. I think each of you are quite distinctive in a way. You know, like Ralph's style is quite distinctive than yours, which is great. I, I love that about, but it's still Oregon, in a way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, Ralph, Ralph was my hero when I. When I joined the Paul Winter concert, we did a lot of traveling, and I hadn't really studied anything about jazz. And well, so R- R- Ralph introduced me to for every chord there is a scale, and you can make a melody out of the notes of the scale. And when it changes, then you change the scale and try to make connections between the two. This is the, the, the most basic learning of uh, jazz theory happened yeah. from st- like studying Ralph's music. When we were on tour, I, I played it all day, every day. Yeah. I had to play those those tunes, which had wonderful, sophisticated, altered kind yeah. of harmonies. And uh, was the, the standard chord changes didn't come to me until now. Augmented harmonies and uh, yeah. counterpoint and um, this kind of stuff was my first introduction. Was I got learned that first, and I learned the two fives later. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> That's, yeah, you learned how to cook like all the sophisticated herbs, and then you're like, okay, now salt and pepper, <laughs> like the lasers. <laughs> That's good. <cool. laughs> no, I, I love that how you said like the, for Ralph that you know that you said it actually for your uh, your bandmate that Ralph is your hero. I love how how. You, how you see that? That's so beautiful. So that's yeah, really nice. I really enjoyed yeah. learning to, to, to play his music in all the ways that it needed to be played. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, the, the music that Ralph was writing s- sounded a little uh, strange on the saxophone. The, the, when he played on the oboe, the, the character of its, its instrumental voice yeah. uh, fits with this elegant, uh, very melodic kind of stuff. It's not really so harmonically based. It is harmonically based, but it's yeah, yeah. a lot about a lot about melody. Yeah. 
Yeah, this melody is quite elegant, like you put it. It's quite nostalgic also many times, I think. His, you know, the, those melodies, at least for me, they're like really mellow in a way also. So I love that. And the oboe then makes it like really heartbreaking almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, we, 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 we were criticized in the, in the Violent Village Voice Press as being unnecessarily beautiful. <laughs> wow, oh, but that's a nice one, actually. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, it's quite quite an interesting criticism. That's yeah, you can take it it's two ways, but I would take it the nicer way. Definitely. But speaking of Paul Winter, I, I've read I didn't know that, but then I read about it that Icarus was produced by George Martin. That's right. Like the famous George Martin. Yeah, the, the the Beatles, the fifth Beatle. Really? And how did this happen? I really want to know that. George may have gotten interested in the consort because. Uh, George played the oboe, which he, we didn't know about this, but uh, oh. I think the things that attracted him to the Paul Winter concert was the oboe and the English horn. So he, he said in his book, All You Need Is Ears, that uh, I was a really great double reed player. Was, I really appreciated that compliment from George. <laughs> <Paul>. <laughs> Amazing. But but how, how, how did it happen? I mean, like, this, this thing, how, how was it worked with him, to work with him? I'm wondering... I'm not sure that I know exactly how the Beatles connected, with, how we connected with George Mark. I know that Paul Winter was always looking for a way to to reach a wider audience and to okay. do some kind of music that was uh, universal in, in flavor and, and yeah. connection. And uh, he, he always sought out the, the highest level musicians and producers, like Phil Ramone produced one of our first road record. And um, of course, George Martin was the, was, was the Icarus record. And um, uh, Paul Stuckey of Peter, Paul and Mary semi-produced one of the early Paul Winter records. Oh, wow. Okay. Before, the, just before the concert. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah. I, you have to look it up. I've, I've, I've forgotten how, how Paul answered. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's quite, quite interesting. I didn't know that. And, and, and I, you know, I checked out checked out some stuff a little now, and I was like, really? George Martin? <laughs> like, how come I didn't know that? You know, it's, it's quite, they didn't make the connection first, but then and then I kind of investigated. I was like, really? Wow, that's, that's interesting. But, uh, Paul, I want to ask you about the 70s, Oregon. Uh, like you, you said you've done 25,000 miles in a van, right? So yeah. How were those 70s like music wise? I mean, for me, it's, it's you know, it's, it's hard to imagine, but like uh, you became quite huge in the 70s as a group, right? So, yeah, we, we, we really did. I mean, like, how did this all happen? Like, through the time, right? Like, separating it out from everything else. Yeah, we, we got connected with some major record labels. Electro Asylum was the, the record label where we kind of had our sort of a breakthrough. Yeah. What, what was going on was that Jazz Fusion with Herbie and, uh, and yeah. Chick and uh, let's see. Oh, all the, the great fusion. Things. Yeah, like Mahavishnu and everything. Yeah. Bob Vishnu for sure. Yeah. And Gary Barton. Burton, yeah. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> the people at Electra Asylum thought that we might be able to reach the same wider audience as their other fusion bands, not realizing that we, the sound decibel label that we played at was so incredibly quiet that uh, a big audience couldn't even hear us, you know. <laughs> So it's, it was always kind of forced to be sort of a chamber group because yeah. uh, the instruments weren't that loud. And we, when we tried to electrify them, like put a pickup on the guitar or on the, the oboe or the, the bass, it changed yeah. the, the instruments and the music so much that it, it, was a, it was hard to come to grips with the fact that we needed to do that to communicate with our audience. And so we didn't. But uh, the, in the meantime, 
uh, we were assigned to a lecture asylum and they, to make a, a series of albums, which were some of our really best albums in that era. Yeah. Some beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I, I love by 1977, we were filling up pretty good sized concert halls. Like we played, played uh, Carnegie Hall just by ourselves, not, not as an opening act. And wow. uh, got like 25. 100 people and we filled, filled up Carnegie Hall in 1977. How was that like for you guys? I mean, like, or for you personally? Well, I was fr quite frightened, but I had enough experience that I could center my, my task, you know, to play the, play the melodies, play the chords and the scales and just f focus on what it is that I need to get right. Yeah. And, and, and stay connected with the rest of the band. And uh, we, it was challenging, but uh, it also was was exciting to have re reached such heights, you know. Yeah. For large audiences. Yeah. And there, I didn't know we were going to get that far. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. And then uh, Colin's wife was going to have a baby. Ralph was moving out of New York, and uh, uh, we, we in 1980. That was happened in 1980, I think. And, we, we took a year off, and uh, our our visibility started going away, and yeah. uh, didn't have the, have quite the impact that we had had in our earlier days. So uh, eventually, we, we started connect, getting connected with ECM and Manfred Eicher yeah. and Thomas Stubson, who uh, introduced us to the uh, European audience. Yeah, I wanted to ask you that. When did you first uh, uh, come to Europe, actually? I mean, what was the first year? I think it was around 1973. Already? Oh, yeah. wow, okay. Early days. Well, the interesting thing was Manfred found that the music of our band was really good and interesting and really fit with his label. <clears throat> and at that time, Thomas Schutzen was doing a lot of the booking of to make it possible financially to bring these bands from the States yeah. to, and to play. And, uh, and Manfred also would, would re record a lot of the, the, he both put people on their own and recorded them, their music on the ECM label. Yeah. And uh, Oregon actually didn't, didn't jo join ECM until like, like 10 years of touring in, in Europe. So then eventually we did get connected and made a series, I think, three albums for ECM. Yeah, yeah. And that was more and more. Oregon became a a European group, and uh, which was great, you know, because the audiences were yeah sophisticated and very open, and they'd been a, and exposed to a lot of different kinds of jazz and kinds of yeah. music, and uh, they were they didn't draw a line. Through every certain things that people people like jazz and might like ballet and um, um, folk music and mm. and uh, blues and uh, all, all kinds of music that that they specialize in one kind of music for the most part. Yeah. So, so we find the audiences there are really really interesting and, and interesting. You know. Yeah. So, the, but in 1973, when you came the first time to Europe. Where did you guys play? Like, was Germany or France or Belgium? I had small uh, concert halls. Our first gig, I think, was opposite Paul Blay in a, Wow. In, I believe it was a, a little room in Stuttgart. Wow. And, and then we played the America House in Munich. And we, we played a lot of smallish but elegant venues. Yeah, beautiful. That's so nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, it was challenging because the, we weren't all that consistent in our early days. And we didn't help matters very much by insisting on doing a lot of free improvisation. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's funny. But eventually we got to the place where we could play, play pretty consistently. But it, yeah. it sometimes it used to seem like it would take a miracle to get through a tune without making some really bad things happen. <laughs> oh my yeah, come on everything uh, i hear like i heard it's so amazing like but uh, uh, can i ask you one, one thing i never asked that like uh, how did the uh, together album with alvin happen uh -huh. 
And but, how was it to play with Alvin? Uh, I, I, everyone wanted to play. I'm sure you wanted to play with Alvin. Didn't, didn't every jazz musician want to play with Alvin? Yeah. So it was a thrill because it was like a, a fulfillment of a dream to play with Coltrane's drummer or whatever. You know? Yeah. Uh, so what the deal was that we were, we were signed to Vanguard. We had a 10 record deal for Vanguard. And uh, Elvin was also signed to Vanguard. And we both, oh, both of us owed the label uh, an, an album. Uh, ah. <laughs> and the promo guy said, hey, why don't you get Elvin and Oregon to fulfill their contract by making a record together? So we said, great. And uh, Elvin said, Elvin heard some of our music. And uh, we didn't have any conventional drum set. We had, had Colin Walker played tablas, yeah. congas, and sitar, and uh, hand percussion of various sorts. And Elvin listened to that, and he said he could really hear himself in there. And I think wow. he could, because there were no drums on the music. He yeah. could himself playing what. So we, we got in the studio, and Ralph cooked up some stuff, some fresh tunes. Uh, and, Three, four, six, eight tune, a yeah. weird one tune, a, a mysterious ballad with uh, with mallets. We we kind of did everything that that we could think of that Elvin was yeah, like, yeah. great at, yeah. and uh, a lot of people have done that. But we had a great time with that. And what happened was that the drums were so loud in the studio compared to Oregon and his chamber jazz sound. <laughs> yeah, the drums were louder in every channel. Than the instrument that the, the, the micro was supposed to be recording. Oh, so, which well, the plus side was that if we had a few repairs to make, no, no problem with leakage, <laughs> because the drums that, yeah. were drowning everything out, and we, we were able to fix up a few things. And uh, we, we, I think we recorded two days, and then we oh. did some, some mixing and editing, and uh, and it came out pretty well. And yeah. we, Introduced yeah. us not only to our to our audience but also to our brethren who played jazz. They, yeah. uh, we we hadn't connected with that audience that well, and uh, people like Richie Byrack and Dave Lieben and guys who were like really jazz mainstream. Yeah. Um, oh, who else? Well, there are a number of people who first heard Oregon because they were checking out this album that Elvin had done. And I wanted to see what it was up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that yeah. kind of connected us with, with our jazz audience. Yeah, it's amazing because you would never expect that uh, combination, right? right? Well, yeah, Oregon was quintessentially chamber music. Yeah, yeah. So, and then you get Alvin, like, <laughs> amazing. It was great. <laughs> amazing. So, so beautiful. But, 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 Paul, I wanted to ask you also to just, uh, it, some other things about uh, like how, Oregon, like how did you guys keep? I mean, I, I think we spoke about that once that you were or still are were uh, the longest working band in the history of jazz, basically, right? Well, yeah, I think they, they uh, <clears throat> what was it? The, the, oh, come on, Paul, I've lost the name, John Lewis and Milt. Oh, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but, but still, was, you guys kept it long for such a long time. I mean, and first he, yeah, modern, modern jazz quartet. Yeah, they, modern jazz quartet. Yeah, exactly. Long lived as Oregon, but they they took a couple of years off in the middle. So, <laughs> but so how in the title of being the longest lived? Well, okay, you're there. But uh, my question is like, how, how did you? What was the recipe? to keep it fresh and going and interesting all the time. I mean, I'm really curious about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we went through a lot of phases, that group. Um, Colin and Ralph uh, did some recording for ECM. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, doing solo records, uh, or, but they're kind of records with other musicians. And, uh, and, and Glenn and I didn't make records with anybody for a while. <clears throat> until, until we signed with Electra Asylum, at which point Glenn and I were both uh, encouraged to, to do some solo recordings, which yeah, which we did. But uh, 
it was, it was, I was challenging because uh, Ralph was quite a bit ahead of us in, in terms of his career. And uh, being a great guitarist and a wonderful writer uh, certainly helped open the doors for, for him and for his audience. Yeah. And it took, took, took Glenn and me a while to, to find our voices as uh, uh, album makers or whatever you call it, recording. Yeah. So it took a lot of patience. Um, and uh, a, lot, a lot of times if we have one member of a group who becomes, I guess, that star mentality or the star, uh, star Billy, I think a lot of jealousy can show up. Mm-hmm. I think that happened some with us. But Oregon was always, for, for the guys in the band, was never uh, eclipsed by any of the other groups that we played with. Um, yeah. Whatever we did, Oregon was its, its own story and its own own language that we created yeah. and, and enjoyed playing. And and uh, so we, we kept coming back to it uh, as a... A group that we really were interested in and could really express ourselves, and a group that we kind of created a language that was ours. Definitely, yeah, yeah. But the, 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 you mentioned uh, you guys started making your your own records. I want to ask you about you being a band leader, because you know you've you've done so many nice records not enough in my taste if you ask me i would love to have more paul mccandless solo records but uh, i wanted to ask you like uh, especially about the navigator uh you wrote amazing music for that one and you basically had like steve rodby and lyle mace and uh ross trout and all those guys and how did that group come together it's basically like it sounds very what Pat Metini would actually do almost later or at the t- same time. And it's also like half of Pat Metini group in a way, but how did that together, the Navigator? Uh, I, uh, I I was good friends with Dave Samuels. He, he mm-hmm. played the vibraphone and it was a, a really a wonderful fit with the oboe. It's one of those, those combinations. And he and I played a lot of duos and we had a group called Gallery for a while. Yeah. And, The, but what happened was Dave lived on, I think, 20, 27th or 28th Street in New York. Ross Trout lives across the street in shouting distance of Dave's house. So <laughs> and Steve Rodby would come to New York from time to time to hang out with Ross Trout because he and Ross had a really fantastic connection with the, uh-huh. the music that Ross wrote and, and recorded. So we get together and, and Jay Clayton was a friend of mine, we invited her to come and, and sing some, yeah. of the, some of my tunes for that Navigator record. I, I had a friend, I lived in Atlanta at the time, and uh, I had a friend, Bruce Hampton, who's a um, really great friend. He, he's died, but uh, he, he, I was saying how I'd love to record that, that group, and he said, man, you can record this anytime you want. I, I, oh. I know I here in Atlanta. And uh, they said, great, so Michael Rothschild was the organizer for that, that landslide record. Company. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we went in the studio at, at, uh, in New York, at, and we used to play together just for the fun of it. We, Ross's writing was uh, wonderful, somewhat into the popular direction, but also very, very sophisticated and enjoyable. Yeah. And, and so, and Dave and I were kind of learning how to write long form pieces. And uh, so Navigator was just the beginning of some of the more extended forms. Yeah. So that Dave and Steve and uh, Ross and I and Jay, um, we, we, the time was so strong in that band that we had never ever occurred to us to have a drummer. Because Ross's time was superb. And Steve, yeah. Like rock solid, and it was really the thing about the Navigator record. That Steve later told me it's his first exposure to seven four time. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> and he almost fainted when we pulled it out, but he, he pulled it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> that's so funny. But the, 
Speaking of your records, uh, you, you're right, you mentioned long forms now, right? Like, uh, how did you compose, or do you compose? Like, did you compose on piano, or like, or, or how do you, how do we start like your composition, let's say, or with a melody, or? I don't have a real one formula, but uh, I, I try to write them coming from different influences. Like, one tune might be me melodically built. But, uh, I kind of develop an unwinding, a kind of a melody mm -hmm. that uh, has its own inner logic that makes it the tune. And, yeah. uh, but then sometimes also with uh, putting a beat on in the, in, in the computer and, and jamming until I play something I like. And then I maybe go back and amplify that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the computer's been good for me because I am like zero on the piano. Unfortunately, <laughs> I get away with playing with one finger. <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay, but so basically you started always on the horn, I mean on the, with the melodies. Mm, it usually comes from my being singing actually. Ah, singing, okay. Like pounding on the piano or the, the keyboards. Yeah. And, and singing, okay. playing along with the notes that I'm singing. Somehow the voice keeps you from getting bogged down. It keeps you, for me, keeps me moving forward instead of getting hung up on like, what's that chord really, or should I change it? Or yeah. Instead, it's, it, you, when you sing, it, it, it connects it connects me with the, that inner logic that the that, that compositions have. Yeah, no, that, that's why, because all of your songs, I think, have melody forefront. That's why, that's why I mean, it's, it's so melodic, everything uh, you write, like, yeah. So I've got I've got a couple of solo albums which I had unbelievable talented people to work with. Yeah. And Art Landy. And yeah. Lyle Mays and Will Kennedy. Uh, yeah. Ross and Steve. Uh, and brother musicians. Yeah. Um, these great guys. Yeah. Definitely. But uh, you, you mentioned Art Landy now. Like uh, how, how you, you have a really long relationship with Art, right? When did you guys meet? Like. Well, it's it's another it's an ECM story, really. We were in uh, in Munich, and Manfred said, "Listen to this great new record we just recorded with Art Landy and Jan Garber called Red Lanta." Oh yeah, exactly. It's, it was kind of the beginning of jazz chamber music, uh, in a way, and uh, we heard the stuff, and it sounded very much like something that Oregon could connect with. So the next time we had a gig at the Great American Music Hall in uh, San Francisco. Glenn got on the phone and called up Art Landy and Art invited us over for a Sunday afternoon jam session in his living room. And uh, we played and played and played and uh, it was fantastic. Yeah. Art really enjoyed some, some new sounds because he was so, uh, he, he got a little overdosed with uh, the conventional aspects of jazz and was looking for something new. And, yeah. uh, Oregon and showing him in his living room was definitely something new for him. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe, I can imagine. Our, our relationship. <laughs> I can imagine that. Yeah, because you, you played a lot, right, in duo records and in yeah, we played, and played. Skylight. You did in 81, right? With yeah. Dave Samuels, yeah. With Dave Samuels. Yeah, I love that one, yeah. But uh, one, one thing I wanted to ask you, like, since I'm a guitarist, uh, like, and I love Nguyen Le, what was Art the one who led you to Nguyen, or or how did that story happen? Yeah, yeah, Nguyen was uh, uh, Art. Let's see that. I can't get it. It's the French bass player. Um, Michel Benita. No, no, it's a, 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 like acoustic bass. Oh, Renaud Garcia Fons, maybe. Ah. Well, that, that was later. I got to play with Renaud Garcia Fons, Nguyen. And Patrice Herrall, man, that was really thrill. We did a little tour. And wow. I was so glad to be this. Nguyen is one of my all time favorites. His, his creativity, his virtuosity, yeah. fire, just that mix of sophistication and rock. He just he really got it all for me. Yeah, that album, Walking on the Tiger's Tail, that you did, that's, that's one of my top. Top albums, really, because your 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 saxophone there and his electric, like Jimi Hendrix style of guitar, is just like amazing. Yeah, yeah. We did some touring 
with that. And that was a that was a quartet without a bass. Yeah, uh, yeah. Art Landy's left hand was the bass. Yeah, that's so, so beautiful. Yeah, beautiful stuff. But uh, can I ask you about some other collaborations, uh, Paul? Like I mean, these guys, I, I had this wave of nostalgia of like how much fun we had playing together. Yeah, it's. It's incredible what what you've done, really. That like before we started this talk, I was like checking some of the records I have you on, and then you know knowing some other records that you did, and it's just like incredible who you played with and what you played with, and it's so much history and amazing music there that you've done. It's like so cool to you know that at least we can talk now about it. I love that so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is this is like a long ride in the van across the street. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We we've done those. I remember you told stuff. <laughs> but uh, can, can I ask you about one? I, I think I asked you like years ago about that one. But like, uh, what one name I have to ask you about, which is Jaco Pastorius, right? Yeah. And yeah, just just was looking at some YouTube stuff like yesterday, Jaco at uh, Montreal Jazz Festival with. Man, super powerful performances. It's really, really incredible. <clears throat> but how did that happen? I mean, how, how how was that? Like, how did you become a part of his band? And like, uh, well, he, I think he'd heard me heard some of the Oregon stuff because uh, he, he came to me and he said, "Paul on Obo, you're the cat." <laughs> <laughs> I began swelling with pride at that moment in time. That's, I think he had heard me through something else. I don't quite know. Yeah. But uh, I, I was going to rehearsal one day and I came, walked in the room. We were rehearsing at the village gate. And uh, he whipped out a, band, a bouquet of flowers and he gave it, gave it to me to give for Colin Walcott's wife because Colin had died. And oh, John yeah. got a bouquet of flowers for her. Wow, that's said, beautiful. For Colin. That's and amazing. Paco stayed with, oh, I know how this happened. So Paul Blay had a gig at Duke's Dilemma, which was Richie Haven's club on McDougal Street. And uh, Bruce Dittmas, Jaco Pastorius, Paul Blay, and Pat Matheny, later supplanted by Ross Trapp. Uh, wow. Was playing a, played a week in uh, this this club on McDougal Street in New York City, and Jocko uh, didn't have a place to stay, and he wound up crashing with Glenn Moore and me. We had a loft on down on uh, Soho, and uh, Jocko came and stayed and played with, played his bass and hung out, and had a great time. At that point in time, we were recording an album with Oregon that uh, featured one of Colin's tunes called Mar Marguerite. Which is kind of a fast strumming, fast strumming tune, and um, Jocko said, "Man, you should use the, my bass on this tune." He said, "Be glad." So we went to the studio, and uh, Jocko showed up, presented his bass to Glenn. He said, "Here, man, let me show you how to do this." <laughs> and Jocko promptly played this roof off the building with his fantastic bass playing, and and. Uh, Glenn wound up actually using Jocko's bass for the, the bass track on Marguerite. Wow, that's amazing stuff. That's but you stayed with him for quite some time with Jocko with the big band, or no? It's just a, no. Uh, we we did, did a fantastic tour of Japan in I think eighty one or eighty two. Okay. And uh, with a big band plus a sextet, which was uh, with Peter Erskine and uh, I'll tell them oh. all. And Bobby Mincer, Randy Brecker, sounding unbelievable at that point in time. Wow. That's and, incredible. And an all star big band, you know, all these great players. Yeah. <clears throat> so it was, but Jocko it was starting to get a little bit unfocused at that, during that trip. To, I don't know if that was the beginning of it, but during, on the trip, he was. You know, Got kind of uh, over aware of his his person, his yeah. person and trying to present himself in some yeah. it was 
shocking or surprising or blew everybody away. It was it was too bad because he kind of was losing his real tight connection with the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, I mean, like, yeah, it's quite incredible that w when you think about it, that you actually, yeah, that band, I mean, like, yeah, like you said, Bob Mincer and all those, you guys, it's just incredible, yeah. But speaking of bass players, I want to also ask you about Eberhardt, because, uh, like, the early 80s must have been for you, like, really busy, because th then you did, like, one of those amazing records later that evening, which is one of my favorite Eberhardt records. It's a great record. And, uh, was you know, it's, yeah, with Lyle and uh, with my favorite guitarist, Bill Frizzell and M Michael DePasco and all these guys. Uh, how, how did that record happen? Like, and that group, actually? Well, I'm not sure. I, 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 I think it was Eberhardt's vision to to create this band and yeah. do that later that evening and <clears throat> we we did a wonderful tour it's like we kind of get ready for the album and uh, we really got so we could really play the material yeah oh wow yeah. beautiful and and then we went to the studio we had to kind of revamp everything to make it fit in the studio because we were really a blasting fusion <laughs> yeah yeah, it was really great, but it wasn't going to fly on the ECM label. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Eberhard was aware of that it needed to change to get on to be able to put it on recording. So yeah. It, it yeah. Was, I really enjoyed it. Eberhard's music. He's uh, so distinctive, and I, yeah. I often mentioned that uh, the music for that album did on two pages of manuscript paper. It's like not very many notes. But in, in, two of them, and you know it's Eberhard. Yeah, he kept it open. So, so distinctive. Yeah. I, I was thrilled to play play with him in, in that context. Yeah. And I played a duo concert at the uh, uh, Berlin Jazz Festival. With just, Eberhard? Yeah, just just him, him and me. And uh, it, what it was really was not later that evening, but it was Eberhard's solo repertoire. With Paul playing along. <laughs> wow, yo, wow. amazing, yeah. amazing. But you kept in touch, like I mean, then you did Endless Days, two thousand one. Yeah, wow, that's a nice record. Very, yeah, and he really was very complimentary. He felt that I was really equipped well to express his music. Yeah, I was really thrilled about that because I, I do really enjoy his music a lot. Yeah, it's beautiful that you, you kind of stay in touch with his music. Also, then that stuff in the homage, which was 2015, right? Yeah. That, uh, well, how, how did that? I mean, that must have been quite spectacular, also in a way, right? It that was. project. And Pat wrote a, Pat Matheny wrote a very adventurous piece. Yeah. Difficult to play and and uh, not not just a bunch of little tunes. Yeah. yeah. Sophisticated piece and uh, featuring the big band, uh, Gary Burton. Uh, <clears throat> and then Amazing players. Yeah. Of, uh, some different arrangements that, that, that <clears throat> were put together for that concert. Yeah. And I think it expressed the, you know, the, the appreciation that all the musicians really have for Ebar and his contribution to uh, the development of. Jazz, the jazz style, and yeah, the European influence. Definitely, was yeah. tra traditional jazz elements. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, just not to not to take too much of your of your time, Paul. Uh, well, just uh, uh, what I got all the time in the world. <laughs> I know, I know, but like you know, it's the, the it. Because you know, I'm just like asking you all these like a small kid in a candy store. <laughs> like, but I, I have to ask you one, one one connection, which I found really amazing and beautiful that you still did. You know, after so many years of playing, that you then kind of got connected into this jam scene in the states. Like, uh, first of all, with Bela Fleck and the Flecktones, and I think once you told me when we were on the road that. Uh, this was like an amazing group to play because then, for instance, before you, Victor Wooten had a bass solo and then you were like, okay, 
I think you said this once, like, and now I have to solo. What do I do now? <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, all the notes. What am I gonna do? <laughs> yeah, but how, how did uh, how did you become like this guest soloist of the Flagtones? Uh, somebody has to play the long notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're you're quite uh, burning. The story is that uh, Bruce Hornsby was a big fan of Ralph Towner. Really? Ralph has a wonderful tune called Yet to Be. It's yeah. a nice yeah. six four tune. And, yeah. uh, and Bruce Hornsby really was attracted to that tune and actually transcribed it and learned it. And mm. so we played it on tour when Bruce was sitting in with black tones and yeah. said, why don't you get Paula to come and play? And so I have to thank Bruce for kind of an entree into the, the Flecktone group. They're, they're great, great guys. They're yeah. super talented musicians and, <clears throat> and, and really fun to be with as well. And I, of course, pyrotechnical virtuosity. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's, I, it's, it's fun to play on a winning team. You know, every time we go back to a t another town and we play before with more people each time. Um, people really, those are, uh, really a great group and it really had a wonderful draw. Yeah. I felt that a lot of times the music was like at the edge of my abilities. But uh, as I say, somebody has to play the long notes and it, it helps with, with all those short notes and fast notes to have somebody playing the long ones. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a place in the repertoire for that. And yeah, I you, played on like three or four albums, I think. Yeah, yeah. But uh, did you and you did tours with them, right? Like longer tours as well, right? Or yeah, yeah. I did quite a bit of traveling with them. That was That's the first, my first experience traveling on a tour bus. You know, big. Oh, yeah. I never knew how comfortable it could be until I got out on one of these buses. I, I, I learned, I learned how to sleep in ways that I. Never could sleep that well before. It was, it was, it was a great thing to get a to finish the gig, go go get to bed at a reasonable hour, wake up the next afternoon, learn a new tune or two, record it into performance, and back on the bus go to sleep and do it all over again. It was mm -hmm. so, so good for music. It was like really focused on th things that would go, go make the music go well. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so, I really enjoyed working with that. Yeah, amazing. Uh, uh, one, la one last name drop. I just that, that you. Did. I mean, being a guitarist, I, I I didn't know that, but then I checked it out and I, I I listened to the album, the Golden Wire album with Andy Summers. Oh. You know, and, and I listened to you and your soprano work there. It's just I think on two tunes. Uh, I don't know Blues for Snake or I don't know which one it is. Your solo there is just like beyond amazing burning and uh, how did this uh, collaboration with Andy Summers actually happen I mean Andy was a big fan of the ECM label he owned almost every record that the label had put out really big time fan he just really mm -hmm. was taken by that music and uh and they also was a big fan of Ralph Towners wow I didn't know that yeah so um Andy we and he invited me to come play on this this album, The Golden Wire, and um, I do a take, and do another take, do another take, and try to get it, and get it kind of where I wanted it, with the number of takes to play and get it familiar with the material and how to express it. And then Andy said, "No, do something completely crazy. Nothing, no, 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 no good notes. It's all bad notes." And uh, so I just went for it a couple of times. And those were the takes that he put on the record. Yeah, that's that makes sense because, like, like I told you, you know, I listened to that yesterday, and it's just like really two soprano sax solos are just. It's like really like I don't know, crazy Coltrane stuff almost on those tunes, you know, like, like really cool. I love it. Well, Andy really that's what he wanted. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it cool. was a good experience. Yeah. I've, up, I'm, I've, I've played with so many great people, I sometimes forget. It's been going on so long that uh, yeah. I don't, don't remember everything. No, but it's incredible. Like, uh, you, you know, I, 
before we played, I've listened like, you know, to every Oregon record and I have your records and everything. But then, you know, lately I know I've discovered all this stuff that you did, like this Andy Summers thing I didn't know and some other stuff. And it's so beautiful, you know, to, to see you like what you did. That's incredible. And so yeah, that's I really enjoy being able to stretch out. And I, I, I've received a, a lot of uh, appreciation from my fellow musicians. Yeah, uh, I, I really uh, I'm happy about that. It's yeah. been, uh, nice to be the recipient of that praise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. You, you really, you've got a wonderful body of music. Yeah, also, I'm so happy that you did it. Like I've, you know, I really enjoyed it. it yeah, it, it makes sure things that are kind of on the on the cusp of some free free improv. And yeah, kind of open ended extemporaneous stuff. And, yeah, and and composition. It's really a wonderful combination. Yeah, thank you. No, thanks. Like. I, I, we had such a nice time. I think every I tell every jazz musician that I speak about or interview them. I, I tell I say like you know, Paul McCandless was is the nicest, the most friendly jazz musician ever. Because I remember we did some like long trips, like a couple of hours, and you never complained or anything. <laughs> you know, and you were so sweet all the time. Like and musically also. I mean, you know, it's yeah. So th th those were really, really beautiful moments for me. Like I'm so happy that we did it. So yeah, that I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I remember. You know, I was, wasn't playing the oboe that much. No. Yeah. Uh, what happened was like a, a year or two later, I, I realized that I had Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I knew that, that when we were on tour, but I was having some trouble with my hands playing the oboe. Yeah. Uh, Fortunately, the saxophone is another story. No, a, a different beast was the bass clarinet. I didn't know you, you you killed on some tunes on the bass clarinet, like really. Thanks. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. I, I didn't know it, before, you know, like that you were like really on the bass clarinet, like, like, you know, like so cool. It's a different voice than some of the other instruments I play. Yeah, but beautiful, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Great, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much. Oh, well, good talking to you. We, we, we had such a great connection when we were traveling and playing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I hope I get to see you soon or. Talker Jazz.